Hey, Vin, you've been doing your own work, so let's hear about uh, the angle of testosterone treatment of women. Thank you very much, Malcolm, and thank you, Jean, and to the Society. Um, it's particularly pleasing to be back here again and also I suppose to be lecturing on testosterone in women in the Centre for Men's Health. Mm -hmm. So this is not apropos of a takeover but um, perhaps something of interest. So testosterone in women, I've said here it's all about balance and sometimes we do manage to get the balance wrong and uh, certainly in terms of the way in which the medical fraternity in general views hormonal therapy, I think they've got the, the balance quite wrong. So let's go forward. When we think about hormone replacement therapy for women, I think of it in terms of the three C's, particularly since the publication of the WHI study some years ago, which although now has been, at least in medical um, society, recognised for what it was um, and being highly misleading, uh, it still has a great impact on the views of the uh, the public. There is a great deal of confusion about hormone replacement. My favourite approach to women who would ask me about approaching menopause and saying that they want to do things that are natural, I want to do everything natural, my reply was basically, well drop dead. Because essentially that's what was normal uh, in the days when uh, humanity crept out of the caves by the time that we had aged to the point where our we could either, as men, no longer go and fight off the, the beast and, and kill for the tr tribe, or as women chew up the food for the littlies so that it was soft. The next time it snowed, we walked out and that was that. But public health, hygiene uh, and nutrition have turned all that around. Medicine had tinkered around the edges and we are able to live a longer life. We were never really desired to live it without adequate hormones. And whilst in females we don't need to have the peaks and troughs that are associated with reproduction as we head into later life, we still need the basic energy and the focus that hormones give us. But as doctors, we have been facing, I suppose, this coning of attention, women, oestrogen, bang, 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 nothing else matters. So there's been a lot of confabulation. If we don't know and we don't understand, we make something up. And that's why women are given this sort of nonsense like Premarin and Provera, which is still, I think, the most prevalent form of HRT, if one can call it that, around. So those are the, the, the problems of a, or of a woman trying to find a rational approach to managing the changes that occur as youth recedes. This is one of my favourite quotes, and I believe that it, it, it's particularly applicable to the situation with testosterone, whether it be in men or women. And Daniel Boston was a, an American historian, ended up as, as uh, head librarian of the Library of, of uh, uh, Congress. And the greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance, it is the illusion of knowledge. And I think in terms of testosterone therapy, whether it be in men or women, this is one of the biggest problems that we have. There is this perception amongst the medical profession that testosterone may be dangerous, it may not be effective. Um, we cannot get level one evidence. Well, of course we can't. Uh, it, it, it's it's uh, associated with lifestyle changes. Uh, and unless you are dealing with placebo-controlled double-blind studies, as you can do with, with various drugs, it's extremely hard to get measures of things like uh, libido, energy focus, mental clarity. These things are not amenable to that level one evidence that people are so adamant about in medicine today. So, talking with women, um, when they ask about how they might apply the testosterone treatment, which we will get onto later on, I suggest to them that they apply it to the skin of the scrotum. And I get some strange looks from these women who say, well, basically, I don't have one. And I say, yes, you do. Because if we go back into the embryo, of course, we all start basically the same. However, the gonads that are up high migrate down under the influence of hormones into the labia, which simply enlarge, fuse together to form a scrotum. Clitoris and hood enlarge to enclose the urethra. The uterus ends up as a prostate and we can pee standing up. It's one giant leap for mankind. So basically the, we are all the same and our hormonal basis is at least similar. So for the women, the hormonal key is testosterone. It's essential for vitality both in men and women. Men certainly have higher levels, but women have a higher blood level of testosterone than of oestrogen if, for most, if not all the time. If you actually look at the graphs, 
some women mid-cycle will produce more estradiol than they do testosterone in the blood, if you look at the levels. But don't forget that estradiol is aromatized from testosterone. So if you don't get the testosterone, you don't get the estradiol. So it's an important hormone. As Malcolm mentioned, I do come from the land down under, and I'm not going to talk about the cricket at this stage. But most of you will have a vision of Australia that is something like this, and certainly that's probably one of the more commonly viewed um, ideas of what Australia is like. However, most of it is not like that at all. Um, this is a picture that I took on one of my last clinic trips between flying between Perth and Brisbane. Um, it's an area known as the Gaffer, the great Australian, you can fill in the rest, okay? <laughs> As you can see, we've got a road running along there. And of course, one of the difficulties we have is controlling people's behavior. And put a person in a car on a road like that, there's a tendency to, to um, speed. And of course, that can be quite dangerous on a road like this. You never know, there might be a stray hitchhiker. We have um, stray wild camels that uh, occasionally travel on the roads. And so in Australia, it's not at all uncommon to have signs which indicate that speed surveillance is occurring by aerial observation. So you're likely to find signs like the speed limit enforced by aircraft. Now, this is not in general the way in which we enforce speed limits. <laughs> but I put this picture in because it's a reminder to us all that the thought police are out there. And when you're dealing with testosterone, as I'm pretty sure all of you here know, we have to be wary <laughs> that we are being observed and are likely to be blasted out of our comfortable positions in medicine should we stray too far from the recognised paths and guidelines. If we should have the temerity to prescribe testosterone for men, let alone women. So, more formally, what about testosterone therapy in women? Um, if we look at the literature, Susan Davis is an Australian researcher that. Um, Monash University, published in Climacteric just August last year. She reviewed the literature from 1946 to 2013, looked at the randomised placebo-controlled trials and found that testosterone treatment improves sexual desire, arousal, orgasm frequency and satisfaction in women with desire arousal disorder. But more importantly, she noticed no adverse metabolic effects and favourable effects on body composition, bone, cardiovascular system function and cognitive performance. So going back through the literature, there is ample evidence that testosterone may be of benefit to women in terms of their general health, quite apart from anything sexual. So in women it's produced predominantly by the ovaries, and in the postmenopausal women in particular, in the stroma of the ovaries, uh, which is one of the reasons that um, oh, phorectomised women actually have a, a greater problem dealing with this than, than women who, who go through a natural menopause and still retain the, the ovarian stroma. And the rest, 50% in the adrenal. So about half comes from the ovaries, half from the adrenal glands. And why does it get low? Well, normal ageing process, ovarian failure or ophorectomy. Uh, Adrenal insufficiency, hyperpituitarism, chronic illness and corticosteroids are all factors that can affect levels of testosterone in women. And in postmenopausal women, estrogen no longer functions as a circulating hormone. Uh, the extra gonadal production continues uh, and it requires a supply of circulating androgenic substrate. So that circulating androgens are significant for maintaining uh, normal estradiol levels as well, postmenopausal estradiol levels, but also independently in maintaining bone mineralisation and cognitive function. Uh, this was um, a study on aromatisation, and with cognitive function, it's both the testosterone and the estradiol that are significant. So, testosterone levels decline is is gradual from about mid twenties onwards and it declines by the mid-40s to about 50% of the youthful levels, whereupon if the ovaries stop functioning, you suddenly get a greater drop. So, um, in younger women, perhaps the use of the oral contraceptive cuts out the feedback loop through hypothalamic pituitary and gonadal axis. 
So that can bring on testosterone deficiency. So putting women on the pill so that it can enjoy a good sex life may simply remove the libido and the desire to engage in one. And again, there can be a call for just a little bit of testosterone to allow this uh, situation to be resolved. So testosterone in women is something that can be considered in terms not only of postmenopausal women, but of premenopausal women uh, as well. Uh, estrogen replacement therapy, if women do get to the menopause, go to their regular GP and get put on some form of, of uh, hormone replacement therapy that is estrogen based. Um, this is a study, Kasson and other goes back to the 1990s, uh, women on two milligrams a day of estradiol, testosterone level fell by 42%. Okay, DHEAS levels, SHBG increased, so all sorts of problems associated with ERT. So yes, it may uh, address the three elements which are associated with estrogen deficiency in menopausal women, which are essentially the flushing, the, um, uh, the sweats, and the dryness of the vagina. All the other changes that women experience at menopause relate to the androgen deficiency, to the loss of testosterone. And of course, these women may find that their flush has improved, but their sex drive and their mental clarity and so on doesn't. Androgen deficiency in women is a poorly defined clinical syndrome. Unexplained persistent fatigue, changes in sexual function, diminished well-being, lowered mood and confidence, decreased assertiveness, mental fogging, and over the long term reduced bone and muscle mass. And whilst there is substantial evidence that androgen replacement therapy in the form of testosterone alleviates the physical and psychological symptoms, which are proposed as due to androgen insufficiency, these symptoms are not specifically associated with low testosterone levels. Now that sounds a little bit counterintuitive. The problem is testosterone assays, as we're aware, are highly unreliable in men. They're even more appallingly unreliable in women. So if you are looking for guidance out of the levels, you're not going to find it. And that's basically true in men as well. I'll comment more about that later. So there's often a correlation, but most assays are simply not sensitive in the female range. Um, studies, for example, that Susan Davis did in, in the early days with testosterone in women looking at, at loss of libido, um, they were measuring women on a scale of 0.5 to 2.7 nanomoles per litre and were treating women 2.2 and below. Um, but I've found in general that most females will feel best with testosterone levels that come back from the lab somewhere between three and six. And people will say, well, that's super physiological. But these women feel great and there are no adverse effects in that range. In fact, there are, I've not come across adverse effects in much higher ranges in women. And we'll get onto that when we talk about testosterone and Alzheimer's briefly. So whilst it's worth measuring total testosterone, estradiol, estradiol progesterone, SHBG, um, patients like to have their bloods taken and they like to think that you know what you're doing when you look at the test results. But um, really, uh, I, I, I'm quite open with the patient. I say, when you come in, if you're feeling great and your hormone levels look lousy, I don't care. If you come in and with wonderful hormone levels and you feel lousy, that's when we've got to start doing something and changing what we're doing. So yes, we do the tests and we keep an eye on it. We certainly check on the, the hematocrit because whilst in women it is rare on the doses of testosterone we use, testosterone can increase the rate at which we form red blood cells, so hematocrit can rise and that can create a little bit of an issue with respect to, to the risk of blood clotting. Uh, and we measure the lipids and the fasting blood sugar level. Now, if you look at some of the literature, there are references to testosterone in males as being protective against developing type 2 diabetes, whereas it seems that, that it's suggested the reverse is true in women. Uh, I have never ever seen that happen. And in terms of treating uh, women with Alzheimer's disease, for example, um, I've been pushing testosterone levels up very high, and the only change in blood sugar levels has been to lower the blood sugar level. So the response in the women that I have been involved with um, has 
always reflected in terms of, of blood sugar levels, uh, the, the sort of change you would expect in men on testosterone. So if and only if one is an endocrinologist, then we would do an ultrasound of the pelvis for ovarian size, compare it to the orchidometer, and deny therapy as ovarian size, even if absent is consistent with age. And I think that's probably the approach most endocrinologists would recommend in terms of treating women with testosterone. Uh, testosterone and bone mineral density. Estradiol appears to have an anti-reabsorptive effect on bone postmenopausally, and testosterone enhances bone formation. Uh, but there is an absence of data on fracture rates, despite studies showing the benefits in bone mineral density. So I, I made a quite as an extensive a search as, as, as I was able to, looking for data that showed that women who were treated with testosterone had a lower fracture rate than women who were not. But there is no such data. However, there is evidence that bone mineral density increases. And certainly I've had a number of women in whom, uh, when they uh, arrived for assessment, they had been diagnosed with either osteoporosis or osteopenia, in whom subsequent bone mineral density tests indicated that they had normal bone density after being on testosterone. So it certainly has an impact. Whether that will be reflected in, in fracture rates, we don't know. Probably the data just isn't the data pool isn't big enough yet. Testosterone enhances the effects of estradiol on bone mineral density in women. Um, again, work from Susan Davis. That's basically what we were talking about. Um, but bone mineral density, nothing on fractures. And some more research basically along the same lines. The same, again, testosterone and estradiol. Testosterone and frailty. Um, this goes beyond just the bone because it, it affects muscle as well. Um, and this study, 87 women with low bone mass and frailty, um, six months placebo uh, or 50 milligrams per day of DHEA. So this is a much more gentle way of encouraging the, the uh, metabolism to testosterone. And even with that, um, they, did, they noticed an increase in, in in DHEA, E2, E1 and testosterone, the bone mineral density didn't change, but there was increased lower extremity strength and function. So with testosterone, we're able not only to improve bone density, and we are also able to increase muscle strength, muscle tone, and hence reduce the risk of falls, and hopefully one day be able to demonstrate a reduced fracture risk in women. Now we get to some of the more interesting stuff, testosterone and cognition. Okay, testosterone improves cognitive performance in the domain of verbal learning and memory in a pilot study of healthy postmenopausal women. It's published in 2011. Um, again, to an earlier study, double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover trial, single dose of testosterone and a mental rotations test. Visuospatial ability improved significantly after the testosterone. So there's evidence out there that testosterone is important in terms of cognitive function in women as, as well as in men. And then the work in tes uh, uh, testosterone and Alzheimer's. As, as uh, Malcolm mentioned, uh, Professor Ralph Martins at Edith uh, Cowan University has been doing quite a lot of work in this area. Um, some years ago, when I was working at the Wellman Centre in Perth that Malcolm had been associated with, we did a um, pilot study with Ralph on men who presented to me for low testosterone levels and treatment, but who also complained of memory problems. We sent them along, did psychometric testing, blood testing for, for beta amyloid, and then treated with testosterone. And from that pilot study, it emerged that there were some benefits, particularly if, if men had early memory changes in um, treatment with testosterone. In many cases, their memory changes reversed. And uh, in other cases, particularly when they were a bit further advanced, they were put on hold. So this was an indication not only from their animal studies, which suggested testosterone was important, but in humans, that it was indeed significant. Uh, Ralph was hopefully going to be here, was not. 
So I'll just put in a couple of his pictures from the McCusker Foundation of normal brain versus the Alzheimer's brain. Normal language area, memory area, okay, Alzheimer. And it seems the problem relates, in, at least in large part, to the formation of this protein beta amyloid, um, which is deposited in plaques in the brain. It gets, gets quite a bit more complex than that, and I'm sure Ralph will talk about that a lot more in uh, October. So here's the evidence that beta amyloid actually is the causative uh, factor here. Alpha, beta amyloid is a major macromolecule in the Alzheimer's plaque. Mutations in uh, amyloid precursor protein, uh, amyloid beta and, and gamma secretase, preserolin 1, preserolin 2 cause Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there is an APOE genetic polymorphism, which is the only risk factor. Um, there's preliminary evidence of a 1 to 2 percent loss of clearance capacity of beta amyloid in sporadic Alzheimer's disease. And there is preliminary evidence that therapeutic targeting of beta amyloid is effective. There's also no other idea on the horizon. So what we know is that low levels of testosterone are associated with high levels of beta amyloid in the blood and in the brain. And we also know from animal studies and human now that if you add testosterone and push the testosterone levels up, beta amyloid levels drop, both in the blood and in the brain. Hence we've got this changes level of sex hormones, um, increasing levels of LH, decreasing levels of testosterone and oestrogen as people age, and beta amyloid levels in association with that. I don't want to go into too much detail. This is all Ralph's stuff and he will elaborate on that down the track. Um, however, Testosterone reduces the load of beta amyloid. Uh, it has a direct effect on beta amyloid production and an indirect effect on beta amyloid production by lowering LH levels. It enhances alpha beta amyloid clearance through neprilysin activity and it reduces insulin resistance. So as a result of the um, pilot study that Ralph and I were engaged in, Ralph approached me some years ago now uh, and asked whether I would treat this patient of his, Lorinda. Uh, this is all public domain. It was on a couple of national television programs in Australia. Here you can see in the West Australian in the news. Now, Lorinda was a woman who has a genetically inherited form of Alzheimer's disease and a very progressive, rapidly progressive form of disease, um, whereas in the normal course of Alzheimer's you expect progression at about one to one and a half percent per annum. This progression of plaque development occurred at about 10 times that. So 10 to 15 percent per annum. So her mother and her sister had died within two years of diagnosis and when I first saw her for Ralph she was about one and a half years into her disease. Came into the surgery and sat completely mute. Uh, it was agreed that we would treat her with a testosterone implant pellet, 200 milligrams of testosterone. She had three children, you can see there, youngsters, and they were going to lose their mum. So it was agreed that we would treat her quite against any recognised guidelines. And we put in a 200 milligram testosterone pellet. A month later she came in, sat down, she was smiling, she was talking, she told a joke. And we had to pop her on the pill because she wanted to get active with her husband again. Um, and this is a paper that Ralph presented a, um, at uh, a meeting of the um, International Alzheimer's Society in Paris a couple of years ago. Um, I won't go through all the details. Suffice it to say that um, we had a very positive response in the early days of this. However, she had a very, very rapidly progressive form of Alzheimer's disease. That's some of the <coughs> graphic results showing there her performance on a number of tests. 
along with when she had the testosterone implant here, and can see that um, there was some significant change, and, and certainly in terms of, of the evidence that, that uh, accumulated, there was a significant improvement in her performance on, on some of the memory tasks, but not others. But basically, she was able to engage in activities of daily living that she hadn't been able to engage in in the past. And her family got her back for a short period of time at least, which we felt was worthwhile. So what happened? Um, we gave her increasing doses of testosterone implants every three months. Uh, initially, there was substantial improvement in the Alzheimer's disease. She got about an additional two years of quality time with her family. Uh, she then, for some reason, sought additional treatment elsewhere and was given human growth hormone in addition to her testosterone. She became quite aggressive. The family decided to stop all therapy and she died at the age of 36. So there was a significant impact on that. Um, so much for the Alzheimer's story at this stage. Interestingly, I presented this case in, in quite a bit more detail at a, a, an aerospace medical meeting in Australia at which there was an endocrinologist present and at the end of the presentation he got up and he said, do you realise, doctor, that this lady would develop significant facial hair? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> um, fortunately, the other hundred doctors in the audience could understand that there might have been reasons other than that to treat this poor woman. Um, anyway, testosterone and libido. Uh, Eastern replacement therapy certainly improves these vasomotor symptoms of, such as vaginal dryness and general well-being, but it has minimal effect on libido, whereas exogenous testosterone significantly improves sexual interest, activity, satisfaction, pleasure and orgasm. Sexual desire disorder. Uh, it's often experienced but, off, but not associated with low hormone levels uh, premenopausally. Postmenopausally, um, it, it's a very much more common presentation. However, most many women will not present for this condition at all. It has to be asked for. 14% um, only in some studies actually spontaneously reported that they had a pro problem. Whereas if they were asked, 55% said yes, with great relief. So it's something that as clinicians we have to be prepared to, to ask about. Uh, and then do something about it. Because there's no point in asking if we're not going to do anything about it. So why does this happen? Um, there are certainly physiological causes. It can be disease, people will be on medication, fatigue, loss of hormones, or, and or psychological causes, depression, anxiety, stress, alcohol or substance abuse, or a prior history of sexual abuse or other physical abuse. So looking at this it's got to be done in context. You've got to look at all those variables, not just focus on testosterone. But testosterone can be a significant part of therapy. So putting it in, into context, interpersonal relationships, lack of a partner or quality of, of the relationship, conflict, lack of privacy or opportunity, often if there are children around or teenagers or 20-year-olds coming, coming home because they can't afford to live out of the, uh, on their own. Uh, and partner performance or technique. Um, so inadequate education, conflict with the religious, family or personal values and society taboo. So all of these things are factors in sexual desire disorder. This is the um, original study that I mentioned earlier, the, this treatment of women less than 2.2 nanomoles per litre in terms of total testosterone. They were treated, they went into the study because they had low libido. There was a significant improvement in mood, improvement in well-being, and improvement of six of seven items of this thing called the Sabotsberg Sexual Self Rating Scale. Now this is a rating scale which rates these seven items, sexual interest, activity, satisfaction of sexual life, experience of sexual pleasure, sexual fantasy, orgasm capacity, and the importance of sex. And the six that changed, of course, were the top six. The importance of sex, the relevance of sex to these women didn't change at all with testosterone therapy. It just was better, but it was no more important. 
Um, nature's answer to, to keeping the society going is that we have lust, we have attraction, we have attachment. And there are different hormones that are involved uh, in all of those phases. Lust, about libido, it is testosterone driven but oestrogen enabled. There was a study done with a, with a mouse, I think, where they uh, blocked the aromatization of testosterone to estradiol and found that, lo and behold, despite high testosterone levels, this mouse sat quietly in a corner and wasn't interested in having sex. Um, I don't know why they chose to do it with a single mouse. I mean, even the nursery rhymes, they use three blind mice. But <laughs> suffice it to say, one does need a bit of both. Um, and fortunately, if you do treat with testosterone, then some of this will be aromatised um, to estradiol and um, you will get an increase in both. Attraction relates really to sort of focused attention and obsessive thinking, height and energy and elation that goes along with the relationships, the craving for emotional unity and it is dopamine and noradrenaline driven. And then comes the attachment, the feelings of calm and contentment, emotional union, the nest building, the mate guarding, oxytocin and vasopressin are, are driving this. Um, testosterone mortality in women. This is a study in 2010 by Sievers and Carr. Um, it's a prospective study in German women. Nearly 3,000 women aged 18 to 75 um, those who had the lowest quartile of testosterone levels compared to the top quartile had increased all-cause mortality and particular cardiovascular event, events. So we know there are studies of testosterone and mortality in men that demonstrate very clearly the link between low testosterone levels and increased mortality. We're now seeing the same appearing in women. Uh, testosterone in the cardiovascular system, cohort studies suggest women after ophorectomy have higher coronary heart disease risk than naturally postmenopausal women. And testosterone is produced in the ovarian stroma, so this is more a problem than uh, uh, associated with uh, low T in women who have been ophorectomized. Uh, in the Rancho Bernardo study, another postmenopausal women followed for 12.3 years, the lowest quintile only had higher significant risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, so the lowest and the highest quintiles have showed high risk. And this is what we're showing with testosterone theory, uh, therapy even in men, that if we do push the testosterone levels too high, we can increase cardiovascular risk, probably through aromatisation to oestrogen, because I don't think the people who are doing this in general recognise the significance of that aromatisation and are not monitoring and treating high oestrogen levels. So what do we do to treat the women? In general, I'll go for, for a very low dose of testosterone in women. The women don't generally need high doses of testosterone. A 1 or a 2% cream of a biologically identical hormone. Um, fortunately, we have some available in Australia, but compounding pharmacies can do quite a good job of that. Um, pellet implants, well, I certainly use those with the women with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and uh, some of the octogenarian women with Alzheimer's in Australia are running around with testosterone levels that are probably higher than mine. But according to their partners, their Alzheimer's is on hold. So I'm happy enough to be doing that. Uh, injections are a rather clumsy way to treat anybody um, uh, in, in terms of testosterone, but it's possible. And the Nibido injection, probably a bit high. But again, when implant pellets became unavailable for those women wanting high dose testosterone levels for the Alzheimer's, uh, the Nibido proved uh, quite useful. Absence of side effects. Um, no androgen excess side effects were seen using a 1% cream in the original studies done by Davison. Uh, Davison. Uh, there were no changes noted in lipids, blood pressure and weight were stable. And they noted a possible protective role in breast cancer. So in 2011, we have um, Dimitrikakis. Uh, abundant clinical evidence suggests that androgens normally inhibit mammary proliferation and thus may protect against breast cancer. And again, uh, some interim data, phase three safety trial of testosterone gel in women 
indicates low rates of breast cancer. Uh, perhaps the most dramatic report that I saw was this one from Dimitrikakis by October last year, where they're reporting a case of a patient with an infiltrating ductal carcinoma of the breast. Um, and they implanted um, 60 milligrams testosterone and an astrazole as a combined pellet. So the anastrozole will block, block conver conversion to oestrogen. And day 0 and 48. By day 46, they had noticed a sevenfold reduction of tumour volume as a result of placing testosterone nearby. And by 13, 13 weeks, there was a 12-fold reduction in terms of the size of the tumour, showing testosterone therapy for invasive breast cancer in a woman. So I think it's probably reasonable to assume that it's fairly safe stuff for a woman, perhaps with no breast cancer. Certainly I've treated women, a number of women who have had breast cancers, um, giving them testosterone, testosterone and um, you can then use a, a, an oestrogen blocker as well. There was no elevation of systemic estradiol from this treatment. That's where we leave testosterone in women. Uh, it's a little bit of a strange journey, but a very well worthwhile one, I think.